I'm Matt Kedwin, editor in chief of Dense Microbiology Ecology, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this webinar on polar and alkaline microbiology. Our webinar series enables us to highlight different topics of microbial ecology to a broad audience. Those of you who have tuned in to our previous webinars know that SEMS, the Federation of European Microbiological Sciences, societies invest in science. We are using the income from our journals to fund charitable activities and support our community. Indeed, it is important to recognize that learned societies and their journals provide grants to scientists, organize and support conferences and summer schools, and sponsor a range of events such as this webinar series. We provide a forum for the presentation and discussion of key research, enabling the flow of ideas to a worldwide audience. As an author, when you publish in FEMS journals, and when as a reader you use these publications, you support the various activities in which FEMS invests back in science. Our authors and readers have likely also noticed that from January 24, our journal has transitioned to be fully open access. This means that all the archives will be open, uh, and are free to read regardless of former institutional subscriptions. Please note also that to ensure that articles processing charges do not become a barrier for authors, there are a number of discounts and waivers available. For more information, please take a look at the journal website. Today, our three speakers will take us on an icy exploration of Greenland's ice sheets Growing permafrost and irradiated snowpacks, and unveil some of the adaptations and roles of microorganisms in these extreme ecosystems. Through the talks today, we will discover how diverse microbial communities adapt to extreme cold, respond to global warming, and face the challenges of increased solar irradiation. From the depth of ancient permafrost to the surface of sunlit snow, our speakers will share their insights into resilience and complexity of life in the extreme cryobiosphere. For our three speakers, Alex Anesio from the Department of Environmental Sciences at Aarhus University will talk about the Greenland ice sheet. Then Maria Gale from the also from the Department of Environmental Sciences at Aarhus will go and take us to permafrost. And finally, Catherine LaRosse from the Grenoble University will look at the radiation of snow bacterial communities and functional potential. After the three talks, we will open the session for questions and discussion. So please submit your questions via the Q&A link, and we will get back to these then at the end of the session. Also, before we start, I wish to thank the staff of FEMS and Oxford University Press for all the work they are doing behind the scenes to make these webinars happen, so thank you. Also, uh, please note that if you're re interested in reading more about polar and alkaline microbiology, we just launched our thematic issue on uh, this topic, and so all the papers are available on the FEMS Journal website, and I think there's a link already in the chat for you to go to these papers as well. So with that, Alex, Take us to Greenland. Well, you're already there. Thank you. Actually, I am in Greenland right now, which is a pleasure. There's a snowstorm outside, and uh, and I hope the connection carries on as it should. So I'm going to just share the screen now for you guys, and then uh, hopefully it should be all there. And then uh, laser point. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, good morning, good afternoon, and evening to people all around. And then, uh, and then, thank you for the invite, uh, Max. This is really a pleasure to be here. And I want to um, to take you to a journey to the Greenland ice sheet biome uh, aspects. And um, and uh, and what I'm going to try to convince you in the end is that. Um, 
it's uh, there is a lot of life there, and there is active life, and there is a full biome in this uh, in those habitats. And I'm just covering some of those um, uh, the surface habitats, and you can immediately see in this picture that uh, you can see a uh, green, uh, well, white snow, and then you can see some red snow here turning on, and then some slush and dark ice. This is all colonized by a lot of different types of microbes and uh, and and that's how it uh, we thought about the paper that was published at FEMS. It's uh, it's it's about the diversity of those different habitats. And I'm going to just introduce to you a little bit of two of those habitats and their importance. Uh, if anyone has worked on glaciers, so this is the kind of is the biogeochemical hotspots that uh, people have investigated for many years is the cryoconite holes. And they are and they are formed because of the debris, and then there can be minerals and dust that lands on the ice, and then will outcrop from the from the on the glaciers, and then um, and then they absorb solar re, solar radiation, and they become a habitat for microbes as well, and then they melt into the ice, forming those holes. It's like a swimming pool, kind of uh, with lots of microbe activity. In the more recent years, we have also looked a lot at this sort of habitats, which is the which is the the sort of the dark ice that you have in on the Greenland ice sheet as well, and in many other places. So around the Krakonites, ice can still be dark, and and it has been called particular attention in Greenland because you have all this dark zone here. Uh, on the west coast, and when the ice is dark, it melts much faster, and then so there's a direct impact on the melting of the ice. And uh, to the point that now in the latest IPCC, so we can see that uh, the Greenland uh, ice is melting. We know that with high probability that the mass balance is uh, negative in the since the 2000s. And then there's a strong feedback. This melt has strong feedback with the albedo, with the darkening of the ice, and which now we know that is uh, in many, many places are uh, primarily controlled by these biological active impurities. And they look like that, so it's very different. So it's uh, the community of microbes are certainly the primary producer are very different. So you have a lot of algae, al ice algae, or the glacial ice algae on this dark ice. So this is uh, how it started. Actually, there are other papers. So I want to, to present the star of the paper. It's, it's, it's by no means it's me. It's the, it's the PhD student, Atta Yasma, who did all the hard work with the other co-authors. No, it's um, I'm just the old guy presenting the data. It's um, but it's uh, he's the one that did the hard work and and, and 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 deserves all the credit. And he's just finishing his PhD, and he would love to have a postdoc in a place that there are mountains. And unfortunately, I can't offer that in Denmark. Otherwise, I would love to keep him. But if you are in a looking for a postdoc and you live close to mountains, then get in touch with Atta. Uh, so. He went through to look at those um, different habitats. And then we are going to concentrate here on the craconites and the ice surface, look at the diversity. And, and there are papers about this before, but there's some, um, um, what Ate did here that it, I, I thought that was very interesting is that he was trying to compare many different techniques uh, for those habitats. And he had uh, two different culturing approaches and then uh, and quite a large amount of sequencing approaches here. Uh, he did the usual suspects, the amplicon and the metagenomes. And with the metagenomes, he um, assembled uh, the full 16S length uh, contigs. So you have the contigs for the full length 16S and the 18S, which kind of, uh, it's an interesting thing to do because and then suddenly you can make direct comparisons between the prokaryotic community and the eukaryotic community. Uh, he also assembled the uh, MEGs, uh, so the metagenome assembled genomes from these metagenomes, and then he had the isolated genomes. But in the end, one of the, the main things that he was interested was to uh, 
after this paper was to do some genome mining because it was very interesting the biosynthetic potential of these microbial communities. And I'm going to present some results here about this too. So if we start just to look at the, and these are the figures from the FEMS paper. Um, so we with the 16S amplicon, you have your, so this is just giving all the, the main actors of those different microbial communities in the biofilm, in the craconite and ice. And then let's focus a lot on the craconite and ice for this talk. Um, so you have your protobacteria. So if you just have this kind of the very low taxonomic resolution here, um, the, it's it's the main components of the of the of the Crichtonites and ice uh, uh, community sort, and then um, and it's uh, and it's interesting per se because this uh, kind of uh, comes together with other papers as well. But what it's interesting is, is that if you assemble the met metagenome, the full length sixteen S. And actually, for example, I'm just looking at one particular organism. So the prokaryotic community is still, it's, uh, and if I only look for the prokaryotic community, so the protobacteria is a large part of it. But now that I have the 18S information as well, we can realize that actually the protobacteria on the ice, for example, it's not, it's not the main actor. It's actually the eukaryotic community is the main actor here of, this, uh, of the ice surface. Now, in the Krakonites, you have your community dominated by the protobacteria, by the protobacteria and the bacteria in general. But on the ice, you have a lot of this um, of the eukaryotic organisms, and and it fits very well with the microscopy data as well, and it fits in with the the, the sort of the Krakonites being the hot spots of biogeochemical cycling, and the and the, and the dominance of the eukaryotic algae here on the ice in terms of the contributors of the melting of the ice. So what uh, the next step for him was that with all that information, uh, with the mags and then the, the genomes and the cultures, and then it's try to explore this microbial community that is so different between the different habitats on the surface of the ice to look at for the biosynthetic potential and then look at the potential for biotechnological exploitation of the of this biome. And then for this, he used a um, uh, particular two um, genome mining tools, uh, the, the Ant Smash and the Big Scape. And then, uh, and then to, to look at, and then I'm going to show now a picture that is very, very busy, but uh, it shows mostly here the mags Right, the genomes and the cultures, um, and then from the different habitats, and then in reality where they are present, but and then some of those uh, biosynthetic clusters that you can identify, and then quite a lot of them are very novel. We don't know the function, but many of them they have homologs to um, to other biosynthetic clusters that we can determine a function. And what is interesting here is that you find a lot of those functions that uh, fits quite well with a lifestyle on the ice and in craconite holes on the on glaciers in general. I mean, the antimicrobial sure it uh, belongs to all many many different habitats, but there are many clusters as well associated with ant freezing uh, properties and UV protection and acquisition of nutrients in an ecosystem that is very oligotrophic. So it fits very well with the whole um, aspect. But the other thing that it's interesting is that, and then this is one thing to have the potential to do those things. And those secondary metabol, those secondary and, and the natural products that you can find in those communities uh, have this potential, they might have an ecological function. But and then the next step is actually with the transcriptomics. And then this is another busy picture, but this is um, exploring now the, the metatranscriptomic information from uh, the ice, um, from the craconites and the ice surface. And here I'm representing the 10 most expressed biosynthetic gene clusters 
uh, with the sort of with high expression levels actually, and they are all these bars are from different time points during the melting season. So those biosynthetic gene clusters they are not only present but they actually being expressed. And then uh, and what is interesting is that the ten most um, expressed bio biosynthetic gene clusters on the cryconites in cryconite they are related to they they can be associated with the cyanobacteria which is the main primary produced is the key ecosystem engineer in the cryconites uh, while in the ice surface there are a lot of uh, biosynthetic gene clusters related to terpene and then uh, carotenoids and then uh, and other aspects that are also other clusters that also can be related to that can be directly associated with uh, the glacial ice algae and snow algae. So that's also with the main primary producers of the ecosystem. So uh, then, so this is kind of a uh, summarized artist thesis. And then what we found interesting is that when we dig into those secondary metabolites that are being produced, is that we can link to other uh, aspects that uh, that we have been investigating, and I want to bring in one of the other PhD theses in the group uh, from Eva Dotin, who is currently on a postdoc in in Pennsylvania, and uh, and she in this study she investigated the volatile the emissions of volatile organic compounds from ice and cryconites, and uh, and volatile organic compounds they are also secondary metabolites. And they have a very important role when we when we started here. So we were kind of aiming uh, that important role in the atmospheric chemistry. We want to to know if at, at all glaciers are emitting volatile organic carbon, uh, but they have also a role, of course, in communication and defense, uh, which links to the, the that search that Arthur had for the biosynthetic gene clusters, the natural products on the ice, and. Uh, and what Eva found here was uh, that actually glaciers are emitting volatile organic carbons with all those plants, right? So you have the cyanobacteria, all those primary producers. You actually expect that. And, and the ice actually is a quite a massive, uh, a big emit of volatile organic compounds um, on the ice surface. And 60% of those uh, volatile organic carbon is actually being previously demonstrated to be reported as microbial volatiles. Uh, they have a correlation with uh, uh, emission with uh, between the emissions and the irradiance that I hope you're going to link uh, with um, potentially with Catherine Laros' talk in the end. And then you have, um, uh, and so which could be an indicative of sort of, uh, of uh, a stress response to radiation. But one interesting thing that I want to bring in is this um, greenish uh, box here from the ice uh, that has, it's quite an important group of volatiles, it's the oxygenated bezonoids. So 51% of these, uh, uh, of the emissions from the ice is from those, is is within this group and they have been some of them have been reported as antifungal activity and then whether this could be a potential defense mechanism and then that brings me to, back to the diversity in the in the in these of glaciers which is that actually among most of uh, among the most um, uh, present organisms as well in the this, in this sequences on the ice surface among the eukaryotic organisms was sure glacial ice algae but the second most abundant eukaryotic organism was a group of chytrids so a group of fungi that it's uh, that are known to be parasitic fungi and then we have a very recent paper that I would recommend as well from uh, the Japanese group showing this high prevalence of parasitic chytrids and they demonstrated that they can infect glacial ice algae in both on the ice and in craconite holes and they, they have done this for the for in alaska uh, and then i have a postdoc laura perini that has been working with this group as well and then um, and when we have a nice surface like that that it's very dark 
and then you zoom in and you have all this glacial ice algae. If you zoom a little bit more, you also have your, you can identify key trees infecting those uh, glacial ice algae. So it's, uh, it's quite interesting to see the combination that potentially these uh, secondary metabolites involved, involved in the, all this diversity. And these secondary metabolites involved in, um, in, uh, in cell defense and defense mechanisms, you might actually be seeing that uh, linked very well with the diversity, the chemistry data and the, and the, and the sequencing data as well, the functionality data. Uh, so actually in a ice surface like that, between 10 and 15% of your glacial ice algae is being attacked by those chytrids. Um, so I think that I'm reaching my 20 minutes. I want to do between 15 and 20 minutes so that we have time for discussion. But I think the strong message here is that glaciers and ice sheets uh, uh, have a lot of diversity. And they and they sustain strong interactions between these organisms. So and they and they make sense those interactions. So it's not just organisms land on the ice randomly and doing nothing. Uh, they actually it's a proper biome with uh, ecosystems with uh, with proper plant and animal interaction here, but on a microbial scale. And then of course what we need. Uh, uh, I think the next level and what we are doing as well is to is to get that sort of um, knowledge of those interactions with other techniques. And one of those is the use of total RNA. And that is going to link because this is used in the second talk and then uh, from Maria. And then she's going to give a, an example of that application of the total RNA approach, very powerful to understand microbe interactions in permafrost. So that is from me, essentially. Thank you, Alex. Uh, really interesting. I already have a whole bunch of questions and I see that there are a few coming up also in the chat, but we will hold off to them and get back then later in the session. So thank you, such a neat system. So we move on to permafrost and Maria, share, uh, take us away and look at how the uh, predators get activated and copiotrophs activated with thought. Yeah, thank you so much. And this was the best uh, introduction I could have had, I suppose. I'm just going to activate my laser over here as well, so you can actually see me Star Wars away in my presentation. Um, yes, I'm presenting um, the paper that I uh, first offered in the special issue on Arctic microbiology, as Alex already prepped you nicely on it. So. You will probably learn a lot about what permafrost is, what lives in it, and why it's important that there's actually quite an ecosystem in it, because this is all that I learned in my PhD as well. I actually come from marine biology, so a complete different uh, yeah, place to start with, so to say. And I think if the best thing I can do with this talk is to inspire you to learn a bit about permafrost, then I'm quite happy about that. Um, you can see here the QR code also in the YouTube video later. Please feel free to scan it and find our paper. And please feel free to reach out to me, for example, on X or Twitter, how you want it, if you have any questions or so um, that are not solved yet in the discussion. So what you can see over here in the first slide already quite easily is that you see some broken soil and a broken PhD student. No, I'm just kidding. Like I'm just having fun in the lab. But basically, this is what a lot of my talk will be about. So talking about microbial soil predators in the permafrost, um, of course, you first want to understand why would you call, like, why would you want to talk about soil microorganisms? And obviously that is because they are highly impacted by climate change and they reversely also impact climate change a lot. Because on one end, especially microbial decomposition in soil impacts the CO2 and the thane fluxes that come from soil. Um, and also the remineralization pathways so of the Put back within soils. So a lot of um, the yeah methods happening in permafrost soils are actually measuring the fluxes of carbon in and out the system, but very little is known about how my microbes actually impact the system. But on the same time, while our climate changes, on the right you can see from a really great review on um, soil microorganisms that these are actually highly impacted by different aspects of the changing climate, such as increased precipitation, which actually caused my site, but I will talk about that later but also events such as drought or fire, which is also very prevalent in permafrost systems. But we still know very little how permafrost soil microorganisms react to that. But then 
let's pull up first what is permafrost even. So here you see a little photo of my study site and you can see like any soil you might want to imagine, like there's a brown layer, but then maybe you see the white layer in between and that is actually ice. So permafrost is any material that remains frozen for two years in the ground. And that means it can be rock, soil, anything. And because it's frozen for at least two years consecutively, it means that it stays frozen in summer. So while at the Arctic, Antarctic and the third pole, so all the alpine areas, um, you, of course, have warming events. It means that usually only the active layer is warming in summertime and then refreezes in wintertime. Now, why would that matter to you? <laughs> because permafrost actually covers up to 25% of the Earth's surface. And with that, it actually encapsulates so much carbon that it's about twice the amount of carbon we have currently in the atmosphere. And you can see most of that is actually stored in Siberian permafrost over here. And now you would probably wonder why would any soil like that actually store that much carbon? Well, it's because the microbial decomposition in soil is incredibly low because of the low temperatures that are there throughout most of the year. Now, permafrost, because of that, also acts as a microbial reservoir. I mean, you maybe have heard about um, mammoths being, uh, well, tries to resurrect mammoths on Greenlandic soils and stuff like this. But actually, the oldest found organism ever was found in three million year old permafrost. Now, the way that organisms actually can survive in permafrost that long are when you have a saturated soil, a water saturated soil, and it freezes, the water freezes, but the salts remaining from that um, water solution in the soil actually remain. And that means that the remaining water becomes saltier and saltier and in the end forms a brine channel within um, the permafrost. And that is the only place where microbes could find liquid water and actually survive them. Another way is actually to adhere to clay particles, which is actually known to protect DNA pretty well. But still, in order to adapt to living at freezing temperatures and also high, uh, high ground radiation and low organic matter input, these organisms that actually can survive in um, permafrost are usually very small, and they can be, for example, dwarf bacteria and archaea, and then non- or spore-forming actinobacteria and more. But they are not dead, and that is important. So permafrost actually harbors a living community. And ways how that was um, investigated before was, for example, in samples up to 740,000 years old, where respiration was still being measured, and also under temperatures of minus uh, 39 degrees um, Celsius, which is impressive. So, of course, we talk about very low rates of activity, but there is activity at these extremes. Now, the Arctic is warming. So why do we even talk about frozen permafrost? Well, the Arctic is even warming at almost four times the rate of the global average. And while that also means that not just the Arctic um, temperature, um, air temperature increases, of course, also the permafrost temperature increases. And that has um, been seen almost with the same rate. So we talk about almost three degrees of increase. And because of that, actually, the thawing of permafrost is seen as one of the key indicators of climate change in the Arctic. Now, when permafrost thaws, you can see something like this on the right. Like this is close to my study site and where you normally might have a meadow or a plain field of soil. Because of the thaw of ice within the soil, there can be a collapse. So the soil profile completely collapses and then erodes away. Um, at the moment, we actually know that up to 15% of this huge amount of carbon and permafrost is susceptible to microbial um, decomposition in greenhouse gases. But as I just mentioned, with increasing temperatures, this active layer that thaws every summer actually thaws deeper every summer and every summer. So this already impacts quite an uh, amount of um, permafrost carbon that will be more and more accessible to microbes. But what you see on the right is not gradual thaw. This is abrupt thaw. An abrupt thaw actually means that these collapses can happen within days or sometimes years. And that will actually increase permafrost emissions likely up to 40%, especially because of methane being released. And with a future prediction of a further two degrees of warming, that could be half of all permafrost carbon. And if you remember my metaphor from earlier, that's one time more the carbon that's currently in our atmosphere. So that's quite a lot. Now, when we talk about the microorganisms, their way of adapting to thaw can be many different ones. First of all, the thawing is actually one of the biggest stressors that microorganisms can face. So if they survive it, um, yeah, then they're pretty pretty great because you got to consider that, of course, freezing means that water is frozen and thawing means that, that there's quite high osmotic pressure. 
Now, in former studies that were in controlled settings, when permafrost was thawed in the laboratory, it was visible that even within days, a thawing temperature, the microbial community actually changed. And now the big question is, is it actually organisms that were before in permafrost that used to be growing very slowly, and now from this um, reduced state, they're being reactivated? Or is it on the other hand, organisms that are already active from the active layer being in the state of migrating downwards, which also had been found in the study before? And well, that kind of leaves us with some open gaps that should be researched, but I was happy to find as a PhD student. And that is, of course, investigating the microbial ecology of permafrost while it's eroding. And also investigating that in Greenland, where very little is known. In the talk of Alex before, we've seen that, of course, most of Greenland is covered by a huge ice sheet. So why would you care about permafrost? But there indeed is actually quite some permafrost that is impacted by this ice sheet. So it's good to know a bit more about that. And then also, I was very much into transcriptomics before I started my PhD. So I wanted to take it to the field. But I will show you how. Um, I went to Greenland, and then you would wonder why would you go to Greenland, as I just said. The thing is with permafrost studies that most of uh, permafrost studies in the Arctic at least focus on just two sites because they are accessible, and that is Abisko in Sweden and Tulik Lake in Alaska. So any site that is not that already adds to understanding the biogeography of Arctic permafrost. This is also called patchy fieldwork. And because of that, like, uh, when I did my PhD, there were only like two studies in Northeast Greenland that investigated microbial community of permafrost at all, and that was with applicants. So I went to this site here called Sackenberg, which is a research station um, of the Greenland Ecosystem Monitoring. Because of that, I had easy access to it. Well, and I was lucky to just have found this site over there, just a walking distance from the station, which is very lucky. This, again, as I said before, is an abrupt um, thaw site, so a thermal erosion gully for those people of you who know about permafrost. And this is really rare that you have that within walking distance of wherever you are stationed, because usually these events are really not predictable. Like this event actually happened within days. The winter before it happened had a lot of snow, and because of higher temperatures, the snow it very um, intensely melted and then suddenly caused this collapse of um, the soil profile. And as a little history, like in this talk and in this paper, I only focus on data of 2020, but for you to understand what you even see, you remember the first photo with the active layer and ice lens and the permafrost below? Well, one year later, the ice lens was gone, and that instead was now a thawed soil. And in the year when I came for the study, the soil even thawed deeper. And that leaves us with four layers that are important for this talk. We have the historic active layer that is used to thawing every summer. We have the first transition zone that is thought already since two years. And we have the second transition zone, which is just having thought when I sampled it. And there's still a little intake permafrost left. Now, for those of you who want to know, like I'm not going to read out a lot of numbers of this, but very important to consider is that the deepest uh, thaw layers of this um, transition zone two are actually almost 30,000 years old and the one above 3,000 years old. So we talk about really old permafrost carbon and microorganisms that suddenly face thaw conditions. If you want to see more numbers and stuff like this, please go to my paper. The only thing that I want to highlight here right now that from all samples, we actually managed to get quite a good amount of reads. So it's uh, pretty nice to know. <laughs> the motivation for this particular study was actually that I knew a lot of people in the permafrost field use DNA. And that is because usually permafrost sites are really remote and you can't often handle them well temperature-wise. So what you do is you take DNA, so you have the dead and the active community, and you're good. But of course, because of that, you can't really see too much who's really active in your samples. So I was very determined to bring RNA out of the field, and I managed. When in the lab, I compared the RNA-DNA ratio, I actually saw that exactly in the thought layers, there was way more RNA than DNA. Um, relatively per sample. And that, of course, posed the question, if there's so much activity, who is active exactly there? Because that would be interesting to know. Well, accordingly, my research questions were that I wanted to be the first one describing in situ thaw permafrost microbiomes in this way. And then, of course, I wanted to understand what's driving the changes with depth. Can I see that? Can I see biotic or abiotic drivers that actually impact the community changes with depth? And then also, could I see which organisms are more active, especially in thaw? Because I was thinking, as I said before, it's probably 
um, taxa that come from the active layer and get migrated on, for example, with brain events or something like this, or that actually are permafrost taxa that are being reactivated, so to say. So in order to do that, this is everything you can find in the paper, just, but just shortly, I sampled until the permafrost horizon in triplicate. I analyzed the soil that I could find and I sequenced um, the RNA or the cDNA. Um, for the pipeline, please, Oh, feel free to check out our paper, but we taxonomically annotated against the silver and PR2 database, so 16S and a lot of protists. Now, for the RNA, um, a way how you can actually get RNA out of the field, please, we can talk about that later, but I managed to have a little boat freezer that I kept on minus four degrees to bring it back to Denmark and do my happy RNA extracting, as you see there on the right. Um, we got reads from every triplicate, so that was amazing, and we ended up with almost 6,000 RNA contacts. Now, let's step right into prokaryotes. So what we see in the community composition over here for prokaryotes is actually that the dominance is, lies quite on the side of proteobacteria here in orange, and for them, especially the families Rocodorealis and Nitrosomonadalis, which have a lot of propiotropic members. Also increasing with the thaw, which now you can't see because I blocked it so nicely. <laughs> Um, actually, the bacteriodota in violet here, and especially the family Sphingobacterialis. They were also really active at thaw. And I say potentially copiotropic because this is something you would do at genus or maybe species level, but for Arctic taxa, like the annotation success wouldn't deliver that. Um, when we now look into predators that are actually prokaryotic, and that exists, they're actually pack hunting like bacteria, which is incredible. Uh, we found Mixococota, and they actually made up 6.5% of the total community, which is quite a lot. Overall, um, the alpha diversity, both for prokaryotes and eukaryotes, decreased with depth, which you might um, expect or you might not, but you can discuss it. <laughs> now, the interesting thing of using total RNA, as Alex also showed in his talk before, is maybe not necessarily only to look into prokaryotes, but especially to look for eukaryotes, and that's what I did. The total um, eukaryotes actually still mainly consisted of micro eukaryotes. So by 90.4%, it was all micro eukaryotes. And more than half of that were within the supergroup of SAM. And if you don't know so much about the supergroup, please, we can talk about it later. But basically, they yeah, have some of the most important protozoa, which in this case would be, for example, Cercozoa and Ciliophora, which all seem to increase in the depth layers, actually. So you see that the active layer went onto 40 centimeters and then the thought layers onto 90 centimeters. Now, why would I even talk about protozoa if they were only 5% of the total community? Well, first of all, they're often overlooked when looking into soil microbial studies because you can't, or you can, but it is a bit difficult to take them with. Um, primers, for example, it is possible, but okay, it's not so common as 16S. But actually, they are part of the uh, microbial foot web. And because of, by the way, they're here, because of their impact on the organic matter um, fluxes and also on root exodus, especially in Arctic permafrost systems, they might impact this whole discussion on if the Arctic will be browning because of the thaw or will be greening because of the thaw enabling plant growth. And we don't know that yet. And also, as a little prep, protozoa are actually single cell eukaryotes that are neither animals, plants, or fungi. I, I probably had to Google that quite often when I started my PhD. Now, I will spare you this table because you can find it in the paper. But the most important thing to see is that I actually differentiate my metadata into abiotic factors and biotic factors. And in this case, biotic factors was just the abundance of taxa that I would identify as predators. Now, to make that a bit more visual, I did some variance partitioning. And that means I categorized my metadata into three different categories, <laughs> one being predation over here, and that included bacterial predator abundance and protozoan predator abundance. Um, both of them actually um, significantly correlated with changes in the microbial community across all samples, which is great to see actually. Um, for the edaphic factors, I um, differentiated or grouped my factors actually into short-term properties, um, that were actually impacted by the thaw. So that was soil moisture and then the different thaw layers and also long-term factors such as soil organic matter content, pH and the H, which is expected to stay stable. But even if I combine all these three together, I could barely explain 50% of the variance of the whole microbial community composition with the different samples. And I found that really surprising because I, like with my 16S studies, I was able to explain much more of the variance. But I think, 
a big part of this is actually that back then I was not able or not possible for me to actually measure the different temperatures while sampling because I tried it, but I didn't do it properly as a PhD student, so I lost the data. Also, I did not measure the soil nutrients, which I think would actually explain quite a big partition of the preferences of different microbes within the system. Now, to shortly wrap that up, and I talk probably way faster than I plan to, but I try to talk you through this one a bit more slowly. Yes, we actually managed to have the first um, total metro transcriptomic data from in situ permafrost thaw and also from thaw in Greenland. And that is great because this kind of data set is available for reuse for everybody who wants to use this post beta, uh, for later meta studies. Because of using total RNA, and that is the one most important advantage of it, you don't have a primer bias, which allows you to look into all kingdoms of life. And this actually allowed to have a little insight into the total ecology of permafrost and also of eroding permafrost. Um, yeah, the second big discovery was actually that of having microbial predators within this permafrost system, which little was known before. And also the potential to have fast growing taxa at uh, the thawing layers. And as I said before, we did not specify which um, copiotrophic species we found because of the lower success of um, annotations at species level, but still this is a very um, good potential to study on in the future. We also could see that actually bacterial predators were at very shallow layers compared to protozoa, which reach much deeper, and we still don't fully know yet why, which is a point to maybe look into in the future. And also to capture maybe like Nitrosomodalis, Bucholderialis, and Sphingobacterialis were seen before on permafrost, but because of the setting of in situ thaw, it could actually show that they were most active in the thawing permafrost um, lens. Um, what we could not fully do, but discussed in our paper, was actually the identification if these taxa came from the active layer. So that's a process called coalescence, which is basically the migration from one medium to another within soil or if it actually was permafrost um, taxa that now bloomed with the better um, environmental conditions of higher temperature and liquid water being available. Now, in the meantime, I did face a lot of issues, which is understandable, like doing this kind of first time work. Um, but it's also nice to have seen there was some work before finding these organisms in soil, but a lot is actually trying to revive them and trying to describe them in a non-bioinformatic way. But I think there is a huge potential of actually using transcriptomics in novel systems like these, because it allows you to have the data available until when, for example, databases improve or until when you can actually confirm data the, the exact species. So what I did not do in my study was actually to fully analyze the mRNA, but it's available. But as Alex showed before, it's really important to have MAX for that, to actually probably make that. Um, also, really important, if you ever take samples in permafrost soil and you have the chance to go there, please take the nutrients. Do that for me because I forgot it and or I didn't forget it. I didn't do it back then. There are some more thoughts on this, but I just wanted to actually close my talk a little bit with the fact that I will do a post-up on this. So all these open questions of actually quantifying the impact of the predator abundance um, on the whole system in permafrost and actually seeing do they prey on carbon relevant taxa such as methanogens or methanotrophs, or do they not? Or what happens if I take permafrost and actually infuse it with a culture of protozoa? Like, can I actually observe higher or lower carbon fluxes? And can I track the carbon? Where does it go? All these questions that came up are actually something I am super looking into. So, if you have experience with this, if you want to talk about that, please let me know. And with that, in pretty much 20 minutes, I think I would love to stop this fast talk and give you a breather. And I'm looking forward to our next talk with this. Thank you, Maria. Really intriguing and interesting to see the food webs coming into play here as well. So um, again, I have a bunch of questions for you as well, but I will keep them and um, thank you. And we'll go over then to Catherine and we'll go back to snow and ice. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I guess I'm just going to share my screen. Um, thanks, Max, and also FEMS, everyone, for organizing this and bringing us together. It's been great to listen to the other talks, and there are so many synergies and exciting things going on in the field, so I'm very happy to, to be part of this. Um, as you said, so we'll see if this goes. Okay, 
So today I'm going to be talking about what actually covers permafrost and ice caps for a large non-negligible fraction of the year. So terrestrial um, snowpacks and seasonal snowpacks. And I'm going to be talking about the impact of solar radiation on microbial communities. And before we get into the nitty gritty of this study that was done uh, in collaboration with um, my colleagues, Conchi, Christoph, and Tim in Lyon, Christoph was now in Germany. Um, uh, I'm gonna give you the background as to why we came up with this idea for this experiment and some of the questions that, that led us to, to look at this in a, in a more in-situ experimental manner. Um, so based now on several years of studies by many different groups across the globe, uh, seasonal snowpacks have now shifted from this idea of frozen freezers um, to actually being considered of as habitats. They are dynamic models that can be used to study many different things relevant to ecology, including the limits of life, um, biogeography, adaptation, and also climate change, and how communities respond to climate change. Um, and these systems, so just to preface this, the systems that I'm going to be talking about are uh, cold, dry snowpacks. So before they get wet with lots of water and uh, begin to melt, like the ones that Alex um, maybe focuses on a little bit more in Greenland. So we're looking at very dry, very cold snowpacks. The trend temperatures can be anywhere from minus 20 to, yeah, roughly around minus 20, minus 10, minus 5, so below zero. So the organisms within these habitats are constrained by certain aspects. So low temperature, because the snowpacks are cold and dry, there's very low water availability. Um, they're generally quite oligotrophic. Uh, there's the presence of contaminants such as deposited metals, um, other types of atmospherically deposited contaminants, and they undergo uh, periods of intense irradiation. Um, that can impact the communities and also several different nutrient and chemical fluxes uh, as the snowpacks evolve over time. And so to study this uh, effect on these communities, we go to several different places. And the studies I'm going to talk about now, just to kind of frame this idea of the impact of, of solar radiation, is related to a study, um, just to illustrate this point, that we did a few years ago in Svalbard. So Svalbard is uh, located in the polar circle, so above 78 degrees north. And we, we were there as part of like a collaborative project to look at um, snowpack uh, variability and impurities and microbial communities across the archipelago. And so we went in April, early April, and we dug snow pits on all of these different glaciers. So we have seven glaciers represented here. We dug snow pits in three zones of each glacier. So the accumulation zone, the equilibrium zone, and, and the ablation zone. So for each of these points, each of these glaciers, we also have three snow pits that we that we sample. And again, for chemistry, physics, and microbiology, um, we did what we call uh, shovel science. So essentially, the fieldwork means driving somewhere and digging. Uh, the snow pits we dig can be anywhere from 50, 60 centimeters deep in the ablation zone to um, more than three meters. And then once we've dug the snow pits, we get on our little polar bear disguises that are also uh, there to keep us from contaminating the surface of the snowpack and the wall of our, of our snow pits. And then we sample the different layers. So classically, we look at the surface sample, which is characterized here. We can kind of see it. There's a lip. So it's usually the top five centimeters of the snow that we call the surface sample, which is also called the skin because it's the one that interacts the most with um, the atmosphere and where many of these chemical exchanges uh, occur. And then we sample in increments all the way down to the ice or the soil surface, depending on what we're looking at. And the data I'm going to show now isn't like the whole data set um, related to the chemistry and the biology, but more, um, I want to illustrate what we've been seeing over and over again, which is the abundance. And so what we see in these snowpacks, so this is from Auspona, so this is our different snowpacks from the ablations, the equilibrium zone, and uh, the accumulation zone, so we have our three snowpacks. What we see consistently is that surface snow has one to two lots less 
um, abundance in microorganisms as estimated by QPCR of the 16S are in gene copy numbers than the underlying snowpack. So this is the first five centimeters compared to the layers. And so we see this for Aspana, but now I'm going to show you a busy thing where we see it actually for all of these glaciers. And the numbers aren't necessarily important, but what we do see is consistently we have this loss or one to twofold log lower um, amount of gene copies from estimate of abundance in the surface relative to the underlying snow layers. And so we wanted to know why. So we had this question, we were curious, okay, what is why, why, why are we observing this? Um, and to do that, I'm going to take you back to how snowpacks form. So snowpacks form as a sequence of weather events that result in the layered nature of snow. Nature of snow. So we have this initial snowfall event that's illustrated here, where we have the first snowflakes that fall under any kind of terrestrial surface, so soil, sea ice, glaciers, lakes, whatever. And then over time with successive snowfall events, um, we, develop a, um, we develop a snowpack. And these are different layers, of course. So these are illustrated here. And so what we're seeing is several different effects when we did one of these snowpacks. So there's a time effect. The top layer is the newest layer. The bottom layer is the oldest layer. And the kind of things that might impact how our community and our abundance changes across these layers is time. So perhaps it's a time effect. The new layers on the surface don't have the time to develop and grow as they do when they're buried in the subsequent snowfall. Um, it could also be related to, if there's no growth, maybe the source of the air masses that led to the precipitation events. So if we had an air mass um, that was enriched in microorganisms, perhaps that layer a higher cell abundance. Um, but another factor might also be solar irradiation. And this is something that might be especially prominent in polar ecosystems. And that is because these ecosystems undergo quite severe shifts in irradiance. So in the summer in the poles, so this is uh, in the Arctic, um, we see that there's 24 hours of sunlight. And so we have a system that goes from complete darkness for several months of the year, so anywhere from eight to six months of the year, uh, to one of complete light for half the year. And this, of course, shifts um, in the winter, but the summer in Antarctica, where Antarctica as well undergoes the shift to complete sunlight. And so for our talk and our samples, we have um, Svalbard where polar sunrise occurs mid-April. So the samples that I, the, the snowpack data that I showed from before, they were collected in April. So that is just at the onset or just after the onset of polar sunrise. Um, so that means that we have this, this snowpack with this community that's accumulated in the dark for several months that all of a sudden undergoes irradiation from sun. And we also know that snowpacks are especially powerful photochemical reactors due to the physical properties of the snow itself. So the, the light hits the snowpack, the photons can travel through. And we know from uh, physical studies that the UV can penetrate anywhere from 5 to 20 centimeters within the snowpack. And that's when the UV is kind of quenched. Um, and this is related to this, this high photochemistry and photochemical reactivity is related here. So this is a microscopic image of fresh snow. We have all these planar ice um, pieces that kind of act as mirrors. Photon photons bounce around and then can, can be re-emitted to, to the atmosphere. And so very clean snow can reflect up to 90% of the incoming radiation. But um, as we know also from, from Alex's talk, uh, the snow is never completely pure or sterile. There is what the chemists call impurities, um, and I think what we, the biologists, may consider as just plain life. Um, snow also has particles, chemicals, clay, and microorganisms that inhabit it. And so what can happen when the lights come back and there's all of a sudden lots of sunshine on these snowpacks? Um, the uh, irradiation can initiate the formation of radical oxygen and radical nitrogen species. Um, so here's just an image of radical nitrogen species called 
and peroxides that can be formed as a result of radiation, incoming uh, radiation hitting and interacting with the chemistry and the chemical species that are found within um, and on the, the snow crystals. Um, and as we know from the literature, uh, these type of uh, chemical species are extremely damaging for cells. So they contribute, they are oxidized and can oxidize enzymes, inactivate proteins, uh, damage DNA, um, and also damage lipids. And so in response to this, microorganisms have um, evolved several different uh, response mechanisms, um, including enzymatic ones. So we have gene targets that encode some of these, uh, these defense mechanisms, superoxide dismutase, rubexatron, buta rudexon, for example, these are some of the examples. But there are also uh, several types of non-enzymatic forms of um, stress response to oxidative stress. And these include things like cyton, this is hard to pronounce, <laughs> cytonemamine, uh, melanin, microsporin-like amino acids, carotenoids as well, and also glutathione. And glutathione has been shown to be among the most prevalent of these types of uh, oxid antioxidant stress molecules within bacterial cells. Um, so this is this is something that uh, impacts cell functioning and what we've seen from, and so there's these gene targets. And so we can look for them in our uh, metagenomes in the snow when we go out into the field. And so this is what we've done in several different places. So this is an example um, that uh, one of my former PhD students, Lori, worked on in sea ice. And she was able to show that um, relative to the atmosphere, we have an enrichment in genes encoding non-enzymatic response to oxidative stress in the top few layers of the snow. And that this relatively quickly drops down as we get deeper into the snow and then into the brine and the seawater. So there is a genetic response that can be measurable in the first few layers of snow. Um, We've also looked at this uh, in terrestrial snowpacks in Svalbard. This is just another example. So we have, again, you know, the UV is quenched within the first few centimeters, but photoactive uh, radiation can go down to several meters. And then looking at the transcriptomes, the metatranscriptomes, uh, we were able to see that the oxidative stress response uh, was enriched. So there were a higher number of percentage of transcripts in the surface samples relative to the samples that were collected at the base of the snowpack. So it looks like the radiation has an effect on communities based on our field data, but we wanted to test this um, with a more controlled experiment in the field. So that's why we wanted to look at this impact of in-situ radiation on snow bacterial communities, as well as not only on the communities, but on their functional potential as well. And so to do this, we did an in-situ microcosm experiment at ambient ir irradiation. And so I'll explain how we did that in a minute. Um, so this is me doing our shovel science. Um, so we went to a snowpack that was close to the research station in Nialsun in Svalbard. It was also close to a MET station. So we were able to monitor uh, changes in, in climate and radiation over the, over the experimental uh, period. The snowpack that we sampled in April uh, was about a meter deep. Uh, we could identify four big layers. We had our first uh, surface skin layer that was more fresh snow, so five centimeters of, of the skin layer. Um, the second layer, uh, corresponded to snowfall events from February and March, so prior to the onset of polar sunrise, and then uh, these two deeper layers all the way to the, uh, to, the, to the ground. And so what we did is we shoveled 30 kilograms of this uh, layer, the second layer, um, into a box, we homogenized it, and then we set up these microcosms in these millipore um, sterile in uh, world pack sterile sampling bags so our t0 was the initial layer we took six replicates of that that we immediately um, melted in the dark and concentrated onto filters that were then frozen 
And then we did 12 um, replicates for a dark, biological replicates for a dark incubation, and then 12 biological replicates for a light incubation. And so these were then set up in the snow. So what we did here is we set this up in kind of a grid. We had our two Zargus boxes. There were six dark treatments in each box. And then the box was filled by snow just to buffer the temperature. And then we also buried the other six bags just in the snow itself. And then we covered it by five centimeters of snow. And then we let the experiment run um, at ambient irradiation. Um, and so the incubation period lasted 10 days. It went from the 15th to the 25th of April. And um, as, you, as I mentioned before, this is right at the onset of polar sunrise. Um, after which, after these 10 days, we took the samples back to the lab, we melted them in the dark, uh, filter concentrated them, and then brought them back to France, where we looked at, where we did the DNA extraction um, to generate a 16S rRNA taxonomic profile for the, for the different samples, um, to look at community structure of the bacteria. Uh, we also looked at the metagenomics, so we did metagenomic sequencing. And then we did qPCR, the B3 gene, uh, to quantify or at least estimate the abundance of um, the bacteria in our microplasms. And so uh, in terms of some of the results, I'll go through that now. What we saw is that over the incubation period, we had downwelling and upwelling irradiation measurements. And the average irradiation rate was 94.9 watts per uh, square meter. And just to put that into context, in laboratory experiments on E. coli, they measured growth inhibition at 35 to 40 watts per, per square meter. Um, so that means that we're already almost more than double um, the amount of irradiation that was, was able to inhibit growth in the, in, in the lab studies. And we also, in from these lab studies, they also showed that just at uh, radiation rates of 7.4, um, there was an increase, an observable increase in the in the activity of oxidative defense enzymes. So um, what this suggests is that by going from the dark to this to this light period, these communities are all of a sudden exposed to very high rates, uh, irradiation rates that might have consequences on communities. And to look at that, so I'm going to show you some data about cell abundance and also richness. So that's the next slide, just to see how the communities are responding to photochemical stress. Um, and so what we see here, so in the gray is our T0, in purple we have the dark treatments. And what we see is that over the 10-day incubation, there's no difference in terms of abundance between uh, the dark treatment and the T0. But we do see an a significant decrease in, in abundance um, in the light treatments. And we also see when we look at richness, uh, we see something very similar. So no difference between the T0 and the dark treatments, but this very significant or highly significant decrease in richness um, in the light treatments. And so what we're seeing is that just after 10 days, we see a log full drop in the estimated abundance with a um, concomitant 25 to 30% drop in richness. And this log full drop um, was actually kind of interesting to see because it fits quite well with this initial question that we had related to why surface samples might have less uh, or lower abundance than the underlying uh, snow layers. So it looks like that the irradiation, at least at these levels, um, can significantly reduce cell abundance in surface snow. And this is just after 10 days. Um, in terms of the functional potential, so we, we have this loss of diversity and abundance, but we found that certain functions uh, related to responses to photochemical stress were significantly higher in the light relative to both the dark and the T0 conditions. And so these are uh, functions related to glutathione uh, bio biosynthesis, as well as sulfur metabolism and multidrug efflux systems. And so just to explain a little bit why um, these might be relevant, uh, so glutathione is kind of the first 
defense system in a range of um, living organisms to oxidative stress. It's a tripeptid composed of glutamic acid, cysteine, and glycine, and it has this uh, thiol, so sulfur uh, functional group. And this group is subject to reversible oxidation and reduction. And so how it works is, so we have this pool of glutathione molecules in the cell in the presence of, um, of uh, radical oxygen species. So in this example, we have peroxide. Um, glutathione is oxidized to form, so here oxidized to form glutathione disulfide. The peroxide, hydrogen peroxide is reduced to water and oxygen thus um, reducing the, the amount of radical oxygen species uh, in contact with the cell. And then glutathione can um, be regenerated from the disulfide back into two molecules of uh, glutathione um, using by NADPH. And glutathione can also react non-enzymatically with superoxide, um, nitric oxide, hydroxyl radicals, and peroxynitrile, so both uh, radical oxygen species, but also radical nitrogen species. And so it looks like, in terms of the functional response, response to the stress, uh, we have this, this uh, increase in these, in these genes related to glutathione metabolism. Um, in terms of sulfur, why is, might there be an increase in genes related to sulfur metabolism? Well, glutathione itself is dependent on this sulfur group, and so uh, it requires the uptake and uh, use of sulfur um, to make the, the molecules themselves. So that might be a reason why we also see this increase in uh, or a higher relative abundance of genes related to sulfur metabolism in these um, metagenomes of the communities exposed to light. And so um, if we think about the functional potential, uh, we can consider that in 10 days at ambient irradiation, we have this higher relative abundance in genes related to glutathione synthesis, sulfur metabolism, and multidrug efflux pumps, which can pump out some of these um, toxic molecules. And it's kind of interesting because on the one hand, we have this loss in, in diversity, we have a loss in um, cell abundance, but we also have this uh, selection for organisms that carry some of these functional genes that seem to be able to regenerate this kind of first response uh, in the presence of oxidative stress. Um, and so I am going to put up some conclusions and hopefully we have lots of questions. Um, and so what I wanted to conclude with this and some of my thoughts about this is that uh, I think lab and field-based experiments are really useful tools to test observations made in the field. So they're a nice complement to field experiments because then we can just test sort of one parameter at a time and maybe get a clearer picture of some of the drivers in, in that structure these communities in um, different ecosystems. Um, I think, so this, this data seems to suggest that the lower numbers in the surface snow might be related to solar irradiation. But of course, this is probably not the only factor. Uh, the time effect might be might be there as well. So the organisms might not have had time to adapt to this new habitat and be able to grow. Uh, it could also be very seasonable, seasonal. Um, so it could be that as the light comes back, there hasn't been very much autotrophic growth or activity, and so not enough nutrients to really be able to um, find better defense mechanisms to solar radiation. Um, and it could also be that, you know, the, the timing of this changes throughout the season, uh, which is why we want to go back in the dark, because studying uh, snowpacks in the winter would help confirm the effects of solar radiation. And then, of course, we can couple some of these studies to look at finer scale re responses that would include RNA-DNA approaches to also look at not just the um, effects on, on uh, antioxidants, but also maybe triggers dormancy and activity. Um, as these snowpacks undergo environmental change. And with that, I'd like to thank you all and thank all the people that participated in the different groups. And yeah, thanks. And thanks to everyone for, yeah. Thank you. Uh, really interesting again. And um, uh, again, we'll start opening this up for 
for questions. There are a bunch already in the Q and A that have put in, and thank you, Alex and Maria. You guys have already answered a bunch of these questions to you, but I think there's a few that we want to get back into. Uh, just thinking here from a couple that are here in the um, from the audience, and this is about depth of the snow pump, and actually two separate questions. One is temperature with depth. How does that factor in and on microbial activities? How much does that change over several meters? And then, of course, also this question of the impact of radiation. How deep into the snowpack would you still see penetration and, and these effects on, on bus? Okay, so the, the great questions. Um, the impact on the, I'll start with temperature. So, of course, uh, snow is a great insulator, which also has an impact on permafrost and you know, warming and also the underlying ice. And so what we see is even over a meter, we can have something that at the surface is minus 15 to uh, basal snow that can be almost zero degrees, depending on where we are in the season. So, of course, the effect of temperature means that uh, warmer probably has more liquid water in it. And that would, of course, favor growth as well. So the lower, you know, the lower layers of the snowpack are likely more hospitable for, for microorganisms and microbial activity. Um, so I do think that plays a role. Um, and then related to ROS, um, there's a few ideas about this. So while we know that the UV is quenched in the upper centimeters of the snow, so five to 20, depending on the purity. So in Antarctica, where there's less material in the snowpack, uh, UV tends to penetrate a little bit deeper. Um, there is an idea, although I would have to talk to some of the chemists again, that some of the molecules that are, uh, so some of the radicals could also propagate downwards. So that's a hypothesis as well. So they might be generated in the surface, but because the snowpack has wind pumping and you know there's air circulating through it, it could potentially also cycle through the snowpack. Um, but the actual generation of it happens in the top uh, centimeters of the snowpack. How old is this, actually, if you're thinking about the deeper layers? I mean, how many years of accumulation oh. are you looking at? And, and therefore, of course, growth or potential growth of the community. So in most cases, we're actually looking at the snow that fell that year. Okay, so that's why these snowpacks are so cool because they, you know, the snow starts maybe October, November, depending on where you are, and then melts out May, June, again, depending on where you are. So you have this like mini life cycle that is anywhere between eight to 10 months where you see, you know, so many really exciting ecological processes like colonization, horizontal gene transfer, shifts in dormancy and activity. And then it, you know, it melts out and it starts again. And then for the multi-year yeah. snow, it's actually turning into fern. So it's no longer really snow. Yeah. No. So that's, I'm thinking also different on, on some of the questions that came to Alex regarding the Greenland ice sheet. Well, of course, you're looking at multi-year yeah. systems. Uh, and actually, Alex froze. No, did you freeze? Uh, so the question there, in terms of in your system, Catherine, you're looking at microbial communities that are basically coming with wind and getting deposited right then. So these are like fresh uh, incomers. With Alex, what's the situation there on the ice sheet? You're looking at multi-year communities that are coming and evolving versus the aspect of how much is coming fresh into the community with, with wind. Yeah, so the, the problem for us is that we never go to the same place every year. And then so we don't have that sort of multi-year uh, analysis that we are severely missing that sort of the developing of those communities over here. And then, uh, and then this, the, the community on the ice is also... I mean, it can be similar to, in that sense, to the snow because the the ice might be old, but the community that is in the surface growing there, so it develops because 
suddenly it's, it, it is the part of the ice that is melting during the summer. And then it's when we have melts that that's when you have the all the life processes happening. Um, and then it's, uh, and, and then the one thing about, for example, for the darkening that we know is that um, this darkening is, uh, it, it's, it's darkening every year. So there's there's a darkening process on the Greenland ice sheet, and then and then the problem is that um, is we know that from the satellites, but the satellites cannot really differentiate at the moment between the minerals, the dust, and the microbes. So we assume that when we look to, so go to certain places, that uh, most of the darkening is because of the microbes, and then we assume that the darkening is also because of the microbes, but could also be an element of dust and mineral that uh, that provide the nutrients for the microbes to grow, and then they dark the ice further. Yeah, and I think okay. if I could just interject, oops, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Just to add on to, to Alex's point, so I think that's also a question of timing. So, you know, in the cold, dry snowpacks, the darkening is often related to things like black carbon or dark particles because this exponential growth hasn't occurred yet. So it could be that in the in the spring, winter, before, you know, it establishes, you have more of a, an effect of those things. And then when the growth happens, it completely takes over. So... Yeah, so it's uh, the timing is really important because the the people work on snow, I guess, and black carbon and snow. They are work on springtime, and then we are working the middle of the summer when the snow is gone, and then we are working the bare ice. So you're seeing also a lot of VOCs being produced, I guess, mainly from the phototrophs, correct? Yeah. So if it's to me, yeah, there's a lot of VOC being produced. So how is that then? Do you see that as feeding the heterotrophic microbial community? And that you see that carbon being consumed very quickly, or is it released to the atmosphere? Yes. Yeah, so I think that there's a dose of export with the ice melt. So you might you you have quite a a, a large amount of DOC that is going. I mean, the DOC come from glaciers in the end because when it's uh, diluted with uh, the snow melt up on the snow uh, up the, on the ice and so on, and then it's not as microbial rich, and then it gets diluted, so it looks small. But but most of that DOC is microbially available. Um, actually, so the the analysis on the molecular characterization of the DOC indicates that um, DOC from glaciers is quite uh, labile for heterotrophic processes. So part of it is going to be exported, part of it is going to be utilized. If it reaches the cryoconites, and then it's utilized faster because there's much more heterotrophic bacteria there okay. than yeah. on the surface of the ice. And then some is going to be photoxidized as well on the surface of the ice. So there's a, uh, we just have a, a paper now submitted that uh, gives a quite a good indication that this, there's a photochemical process happening on the surface of the ice as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So I want to go to Maria for a question on the protozoa. And again, you're seeing an increase in abundance I, I guess, well, there's more to, to feed on now in the thawed permafrost. But do you know or do you have an identification of are they, have they been there in that frozen permafrost waiting for the thaw? Or do you see migration of these protozoan communities from the active layer? Exactly. I think this is the discussion that we faced in the paper where we realized we didn't have yet the tools to prove it. But of course, it's an, a super interesting point to talk about, especially with mm -hmm. protozoa, as far as I understand. There's quite some different stages of rest that they can achieve to survive hardship, so to say. And there is this idea that, I mean, larger entities can actually also remain in just in cryobios, uh, biogenesis that they can just like sustain in cold times, but also they can form resting stages. And I just see that in terms of RNA, I did not find as much protozoan abundance as I, in permafrost as I did in the thought layers. So I think it suggests, I mean, they are quite fast growing. They can uh, increase in abundance within two days, for example. They can be partly way mobile than, for example, the predatory bacteria. 
And considering that there was this Iceland that melted and then transported quite an amount of moisture or even moistured um, the soil that there was, I think this just enables um, migration for protozoa much more easily than you would expect. And okay. what I don't understand and what I what I still find interesting is that we can't see the same pattern with the bacterial predators, because I would have thought that a bacterial predator can even repopulate faster because it's bacterial, right? But I, I wonder if that has something to do with like slower um, growing curves, so to say, at lower temperatures, because the temperatures are still low. We don't talk about like a 20 degree E. coli or something. Yeah. So it is an interesting pattern. So I wonder if maybe bacteria predators feed better off the active layer where you still have more easily accessible organic matter in comparison to the permafrost that just thought, where maybe there's quite a high abundance of dead bacteria that protozoa might be able to feed on, maybe bacteria don't. Because these permafrost um, taxa, I mean, a lot of them might be dead, and a lot of them are inactive and like very dwarfed. So I think for bacteria, it's quite hard to pierce the shell, so to say, of a permafrost dwarf bacteria, for example, while a protozoa just might ingest it. So I have the idea that that maybe has to do with why we find more protozoa deeper. What is the temperature of the permafrost? So if you go to that frozen layer, what is that temperature? Yeah. That one was still at minus four, where like okay. the moment of sampling it. Um, but obviously, I think at the end of my sampling period, it was probably thawed because it was just the onset of, of thawing there, basically. Okay. But even then, at minus four, I mean, there is, of course, a lot of data showing microbial growth activity. So it's not a dormant microbial community, it's just a slower growing one. Exactly. And that was also one of the key insights from this paper, so to say that you, because of the amount of reads we cut out of the system, it was quite easy to see like there is quite some activity to be found even in the permafrost. And that is also this kind of misunderstanding that everything is dormant in permafrost or dead, like it is active, but at a very low base activity. Mm -hmm. And now there is this interesting discussion if, if now this permafrost warms, if these um, organisms then are better adapted because at higher temperature, they have a higher en en enzymatic activity or efficiency, mm -hmm. so to say, or if, of course, then the heat stress would be too high. So one thing that I did when I looked into mRNA, I just didn't make it into the paper, but I looked for heat shock uh, proteins, for example, because I actually thought, okay, at permafrost, I expect a peak of heat shock proteins or like at the interface to the permafrost, but I did not find that. And that maybe also has to do with the fact that mRNA just makes up like five to 15% of the total RNA. And I think it was not enough to go into that depth. Yeah. yeah. But thinking also, if you look at ribosomal RNA, being more stable to look at also with a protozoan, I mean, are you seeing species that were in the permafrost to begin with, or are you seeing species that might be migrating from, from the active layer, if, if there is a difference in, in, in the uh, community distribution? I mean, in, in this particular study, most of the contexts that we found were actually omnipresent. So most of these contexts were mm -hmm. present in every layer. And just the um, activity was um, different. So the relative expression, the relative abundance that we could find per contact was then just giving the changes per depth. Okay. And that was also surprising because I would have also expected a very diverse active layer community, which experiences a lot of cycling every year, so to say, in a very stable permafrost community that is very... Um, apart, so to say. But another thing that happens when a permafrost collapses like that is also that there's um, cryo turbines. Um, so that means that the soils actually mix because of the process of forming and the volume changes of, of the thaw. So it can be that there was like, um, yeah, an intrinsic mixing, so to say, that also led to a certain mixing. But yeah, I have the idea because, I mean, there's also a whole story of how it became permafrost because it was a normal toxin before. So technically, we can expect a similar diversity that just has a lower activity than the topsoil. Yeah. But that okay. is a very philosophic ongoing discussion, actually, with quite a lot of papers on it. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. No, and are you recognizing that, yeah, I mean, you do have activities way, way into the sub-zero range, and it's not just about what's happening in the thought of a plus zero space as well. Yeah. There is one question here I'm looking at. This is mainly to Alex, you, and maybe you want to talk about deep purple more broadly, this question about ice darkening. And I, I think that also is going to play a role within the snowpack. But do you want to mention about this in terms of, yeah, just the source of the algae, uh, but also their effect then on the whole uh, Greenland ice sheet? 
Yeah, so it's interesting. So those calculations are, thank you, Max. Those calculations are ongoing. But uh, the initial calculations is that it, it's there's a lot of impact, essentially. Uh, so there's a, there's a clear correlation between the, the abundance of ice algae and the darkening of the ice. So that's uh, so, but it has always been a, a little bit of a discussion with glaciologists because when people looked at the, the remote satellite images to start with, so that darkening has been um, accredited to by the glaciologists as, for example, soot uh, uh, that deposition on the ice and then black carbon and, and then uh, products from fire forest fires and so on but and then when you you actually melt the a bag of ice and then you have all that microbial components so this is one of it's easy to sell for uh, in a group of microbiologists that actually it you see all that pigmented algae so the the the, um, the project has been going very much in trying to quantify that in as many places as possible and then uh, and try to do some budget of that. And in, in places like that west side of Greenland, for example, there are minerals and the minerals are heavy. So if you weight the minerals, and then of course the 95% of the weight is about minerals. But when you do by volume and you start to do the, the uh, and you think about that a cell is very light and then it's full of water, but it's very pigmented. So and then the, and then you start to look at the spectral uh, characterization of that algae. And then it's the opposite. 95% of the darkening in the area of the West in Greenland is caused by the algae. So it's okay. a significant impact. So we are talking about per meter squared. Um, so now let me put in another way. So every year, so in, a, in, a, in a, something that we can imagine, it's 400,000. Olympic swimming pools being melted every year just in that west side of Greenland, in that area in Kangalusuak per year because of the algae. So, so could we just spray an algae side over Greenland to reduce melting? <laughs> I, I, I always get that question, Max. So it's uh, it's uh, uh, well we saw that there's a strong control from the chytrids on the algae. Yeah. Uh, and uh, but we but at the moment I mean it, the it's a warfare as well because the algae is very capable to produce those antifungal compounds as well that we can see. So they say, uh, uh, yeah, people ask that. I I I don't know the ethics of it. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, one final question to wrap it up to all three of you. You talked about bacteria, fungi, chytrids, protozoa. What about viruses? Mm. This came from one of the audience members. So, <laughs> Do you want yeah. to, shall I go for it? There are a lot of viruses as well. So we we. Uh, and uh, there are a few papers with bacteriophages that shows that they are very active in craconites, for example, on, if you think about the glaciers. So they, they, are, they can be very active and they affect quite a, a, a good part of the, the bacterial community. And now we have been searching for the virus signatures of for giant viruses because giant viruses are very good to infect eukaryotic organisms, all the protozoa and the algae and so on. And there is a significant amount of diversity of giant viruses on glaciers, uh, really quite a notorious diversity. And you can link those uh, giant virus to snow algae and then uh, and, uh, and a bunch of protozoa as well. So it's, um, I think this is a field to, to go next as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the perm oh, yeah. Go ahead, yeah, permafrost side of things. I can only say that I know there's a lot of papers on permafrost lake viruses, and there's very few things on permafrost viruses per se, as far as I know. Mm. But please feel free, my data is there, it's open available. Take it and dig in it. Like there is so many great data sets. I have to admit it's a bit annoying that I 
say microeukaryotes shouldn't be anybody's blind spot and I do have viruses as a blind spot, but data is there. And I really hope that it becomes as accessible as uh, performing virus, viral annotations basically as it became now to actually do prokaryotic annotations. And for me, I honestly, I, I, I had a blind spot there and please make the next papers that we can learn about this. Thank you. Catherine. I was just going to say, I mean, we find viruses and viral activity in snow and ice as well. And we even find viruses that are involved in horizontal gene transfer um, mm -hmm. uh, through transduction of genes such as mercury resistance genes. So the viruses are there. And uh, and yeah, and again, I think when it comes to the snow, it's also maybe more of a question of timing. So when the cold, dry snowpacks, where there is quite a bit of dormancy, but still a little bit of activity, um, there's also a spatial segregation of the organisms because they're sort of heterogeneously found within the snow. But then, you know, as it gets warmer, still below zero, you increase habitat mixing and contact rates. And then, you know, maybe you have more of a, an impact on some of the viruses. So it's also, I think, a question of timing and dynamics in these systems. Okay. Thank you. I think we're going to have to wrap it up there. Uh... So thank you, Maria, Catherine, Alex. It was wonderful getting together on this. Really enjoyed your talks. And thank you, everybody in the audience from around the world for joining us as well. And you can read more about these studies in, in the journal, as well as all the other papers that are now part of the thematic issue on polar and alpine microbiology. So a lot of interesting reading for you as well. And hope to meet you all in person soon again. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thanks.